Good evening, and welcome to the March edition of Democracy is Not a Spectator Sport, a one-hour monthly production of the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut. I'm Susan Dombrowski, resident of the town of Franklin, where I'm privileged to serve on the Board of Finance and also the Planning and Zoning Commission. I'm also a member of the League of Women Voters. We're here tonight to talk about the recently raised Registrar of Voters legislation, SB 1051. It is an act strengthening Connecticut's elections. What could there possibly be to discuss? We'll soon find out. With us tonight is Connecticut Secretary of State, Denise Merrill, Registrar of Voters Association of Connecticut, President Melissa Russell, and Rhode Island's Director of Elections, Rob Rock. As part of learning more about the many parts to the bill and our panelists' positions, we'll hear how unique Connecticut's system is, and unique is not always better, and how elections are handled differently in Rhode Island. Denise Merrill was elected as Connecticut's 73rd Secretary of State in November 2010. As Secretary of State, Denise Merrill serves as Chief Elections Official and Business Registrar for the state of Connecticut. Since taking office, Secretary Merrill has focused on modernizing Connecticut's election process, making voting easier, and improving information given to businesses that incorporate in our state. Prior to her election as Secretary of State, Denise Merrill served as a state representative for 17 years, representing the towns of Mansfield and Chaplin. First elected to the General Assembly in 1994, Denise rose to the rank of House Majority Leader, and she also served as the House Chair of the Budget Writing Appropriations Committee and as Vice Chair of the Committees on Education and Government Administration and Elections. In 2009, Denise Merrill was named by her colleagues in the legislature as the most respected by the other side of the aisle. Very impressive, ma'am. Secretary Merrill is a graduate of the University of Connecticut, is licensed to practice law in the state of California, and is a classically trained pianist. She lives in Hartford. In her free time, she enjoys gardening, hiking, skiing, playing piano, and spending time with her four grandchildren. Secretary Merrill, please tell us what you think SB 1051 is all about, what we have in place today, and why you think changes are necessary. I started reading the bill. It's 201 pages long, but that's a topic for another hour, not just focused on the, art, on the registrar of voters issue. Tell us what's in there. No, it is not just focused on registrars of voters. What this bill seeks to do is to improve our elections uh, in a number of ways, actually. And it really does stem from my experience the last four years in particular with elections in Connecticut. Um, I don't think it's a, a secret anymore that in 2010, for example, we had a major problem in Bridgeport, which made national news. Uh, the state of Connecticut ended up in court that day uh, to try to rectify the situation, which was basically they ran out of a lot of ballots. Uh, so in 2011, when I first came in office, uh, I then put in place, along with the General Assembly, why, you know, uh, bipartisan, almost unanimous support, we put in some more reporting requirements, basically. And then again, it happened again uh, this past election. We had a major breach in procedure in Hartford. So I think those things have informed what I'm, I'm proposing, but it really is about the voter experience. What I want is an election system that is seamless. Voters shouldn't have to worry about who's doing what. They want to get there and they want to vote with no problem. And that's what I want to do. 
Connecticut has an unusual system, and it's back to the old 169 towns problem. Mm -hmm. We don't have counties. We don't have a way to kind of, as I would say, efficiently run elections. And we do it the way we've done it for 100 years. Um, but in this day and age, we have a lot more technology that's coming into place. We want to make this a better system. It's not like it was 100 years ago. People tend to move around a lot more, so we have a lot more uh, you know, work to do on keeping lists accurate and that sort of thing. Uh, this proposal really seeks to change the way we do elections in Connecticut in the sense that we have would have different officials uh, running our elections. I think our system suffers from being uh, too expensive because it's 169 towns all doing it. Um, and it's, it is rather partisan because the way it's done right now is there's, there's no one person directly in charge of elections in each town. There are two elected registrars, one from each party appointed by their party. And there's also a role for town clerks that, that do absentee ballots and some other functions of elections. And because the registrars are elected officials, it's really very difficult to put in place what I would call standards of performance that you would need for a job like this. It's basically an administrative job. You're keeping lists, you're hiring people for the poll, poll workers on the day of election. And so what I'm looking for is one kind of administrative position rather than the two elected partisan people we have in place now. And a number of accountability measures, things like you know required training and certification and job experience and knowledge, so that 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 would be still controlled at the town level, because frankly, I'd prefer to have one big system. Ultimately, maybe that's where we'll head. But Connecticut's the same size as San Diego County, and they have one election process. So. <laughs> It's, it's difficult to manage within what we have. I still kind of like the local election process. And so working within that, this is my best shot at what I think we should do to move forward. OK, that makes perfect sense. We'll move next to a visitor that we have from the far side of the state, Melissa Russell. She's been the registrar of voters from the town of Bethlehem since 2007. Prior to becoming registrar, she served as a deputy registrar and a poll worker in various capacities for several years. Can we pine for a minute for the lever machines? <laughs> I they loved those. Great. Yeah. <laughs> they were not as great as you think they were. Yeah, but you knew you were voting when you went in and there, pulled that lever. <laughs> ah, we'll talk about that. Since becoming a registrar and a member of the Registrar of Voters Association of Connecticut, she has served as a member of its board of directors and executive vice president and is currently in her first year, first term as president. She has also served on the association's conference, education and legislative committees and has chaired the latter committee. When not involved with registrar or ROVAC duties, she works as a jewelry artist and antiques dealer and lives in Bethlehem with her husband and two cats. That sounds like my life. <laughs> Melissa, an act concerning strengthening Connecticut's elections. It sounds like a good thing. What is ROVAC's position? We agree with most of this bill. Um, the technological improvements in it, the uh, posting of ID requirements in the polling places. These are all really things that are, are kind of simple things but have not happened yet and need to happen. And revamping our end of night reporting system so that Connecticut is not one of the last states to have their results in when we're all watching the news at the end of the night. So there's more we agree on than disagree on. Where we disagree or where we differ is how who runs those elections. Currently we have two dual elected registrars per municipality. We believe that gives balance, it gives transparency, gives each party a voice in the process. It's something that we feel strongly about. Um, we don't feel that having one appointed registrar uh, who would be you know, uh, loyal to the person that appointed them or the body that appointed them is a better solution than someone who's accountable to the voters who put them in. Hmm, interesting. All right, and to our third guest this evening, Robert B. Rock is the Director of Elections for the Secretary of State's Office in Rhode Island. Mr. Rock had been the Town Administrator for Richmond, Rhode Island, where he managed the town's day-to-day -day operations. Prior to becoming Richmond's Town Administrator, Mr. Rock was an Elections Assistant for Rhode Island's Elections Division, where he managed the statewide voter registration system for federal, state, and local elections. Mr. Rock was also the liaison between the Secretary of State's Elections Division and the 39 cities and towns 
boards of canvassers and town's clerk's offices. A resident of East Pro Providence, Mr. Rock is a graduate of LaSalle Academy and the University of Rhode Island, where he has also completed his master's degree in public administration. He has also served on a number of election-related community activities, such as the Voters' Choice Commission and the Civic Education Commission, as well as worked as a poll worker in East Providence. Rob, this is cheeky, but I can't believe we're gonna take any sort of political advice from Rhode Island. <laughs> Tell us what you folks do differently so that we might learn from our neighbors to the east. Sure, uh, in Rhode Island, we're, while Connecticut's small, uh, Rhode Island's even smaller. We only have 39 cities and towns in the state. And we are fortunate enough to operate uh, with one system. All 39 cities and towns run elections the same way. Uh, there are two state agencies that oversee elections, uh, the Secretary of State's Elections Division and the Rhode Island State Board of Elections. And then each of the 39 communities have a, a board of canvassers, which is a three-member appointed board, and they're appointed by the, either the legislative or the executive branch of that particular town, whether it's a city or town council or a mayor, city manager, what have you. And those three individuals, there can be no more than two per political party, so it's usually a two-to-one split with Democrat, Republican, and they're in charge of hiring their staff that run the actual day-to-day -day elections uh, in, in the, each of their offices. So the board members don't actually do the day-to-day -day work. They hire uh, or appoint people to run the elections and run the day-to-day -day activities for the elections. So we do, and there are a handful of communities that do elect uh, the town clerk in, the, in particular towns, and they actually oversee the elections, but in, uh, in pretty much all 10 cases, they do have individuals that are appointed that actually do the day-to-day -day work while being overseen by the town clerk's office. Okay, that's interesting. I have some questions that I think might help our viewers better understand the issues at hand. The testimony that I had read of those which are in favor of the law stresses that democracy is the foundation upon which America was built and what we strive to achieve in the future. To me, democracy is getting involved, serving in government, whether on state, local, or in the national level, and being an active and informed voter or by participating, by demonstrating, organizing, or getting in on the action to make your voice heard. Voters, the public, must trust that the system works. We need to have full confidence in the competence, experience of those charged with the electoral process from aligning voter registration dates to ensuring that everything goes exactly as it should on election day. In order to achieve this goal, registrars and their helpers must be professional and experienced in management administration, and emerging technologies. They must be held accountable for their actions and performance and always act in a nonpartisan manner. Denise, would you say you agree or disagree? Well, I completely agree. And that's sort of the nugget of the problem here, which is that <laughs> people that are appointed to these positions are frequently not appointed for those skills. And that's evolved over time. And of course, there are many people who are very good at what they do. And many of the registrars are, are extremely competent. And many are not hired for those skills. So you know, it's, it's a very uneven situation. And that's exactly what I'm after. I'm after some way of ensuring that we have a level of competence across all 169 towns. And it's a challenge. Think about a town, like I used to represent Chaplin, for example, 2,500 people, probably 1,000 voters in town. And so it's, it's a much more minimal job to register people. You might have, I don't know how many people you'd have register a year, but not too many. And it's a much different sort of job, and yet every town has to have the same two people. So in some cases, like in Chaplin, they might come in one day a month and be paid as little as $1,000 a year to do the job. And that's the challenge, I think, with our current system, is how do we get um, you know, competence across all these different uh, kinds of cities and towns? You know, I always like to remind people, again, you know, we're the size of uh, San Diego County. We shouldn't have all these different little systems. It's very difficult to get away from. And so our office, I think, needs to have a little more influence in, in providing training and assistance and compulsory certification and training. And that's the problem. How do you compel people to participate in that level of training if they're these very minimal jobs that are elected and you can't really require these things? Some people are great and they come to the trainings and they listen to all the advice and they, 
they do their best to carry it all out. But it's an increasingly uh, uh, scrutinized area. Mm -hmm. We've had two very, very close gubernatorial elections. And I think that's part of the reason this is coming to the foreground now, because now suddenly you're hearing, you're hearing about this. People really want to know more about this as the races are so close. And so I think that's combined with the, actually a cutting back at the local level of resources. I think that has again influenced why we're where we are, because they, as they try to cut back, we've had the ballot shortage. I think that was to some degree because the city said, you know, we want you to cut back on your costs. And sometimes that doesn't go so well. The same thing in 2012 in a place like West Hartford, where you had huge lines at the polls. This was during the presidential election. And again, they collapsed 21 districts down to 11 and didn't do the proper planning, so you ended up with a situation. These, again, as you say, are management issues. They're really not partisan issues as such. And so that's what we're trying to get to, is a place where we can provide that kind of support and have the right resources in the right places. You just said something interesting, and I'm gonna follow up with a question to Melissa. You said that the issues that are coming up are management and uh, issues um, on an administrative level, not partisan. Melissa, I noticed in your testimony that you're concerned about having checks and balances in place, two sets of eyes on the process. So that would be presumably Democrat and Republican. But what about the thousands of unaffiliated voters or the emergence of a strong third party? What does the ROVAC membership feel about that? Well, we do. when we do have an emergence of a strong third party in the case of Hartford, you, are, you do get a third registrar. We have a Working Families Party registrar because the way the statutes are written, they got more votes than the Republican registrar, so they immediately are seated as a third registrar. Um, it, we're a two-party state. We are, ballots are, are on party lines. Uh, primaries are closed primaries. It, it's, it's maybe not fair to the unaffiliated voters, but that is the way we operate elections and party rules in this state. So it's not terribly surprising that you would have registrars that represent each party. Um, as far as the fact that a lot of the issues that come about are not because of partisan issues, well, that's because there's two of them there balancing each other out. Um, when things aren't, don't work right because of a failure to order enough ballots, for instance, um, it, that's, a, that's a miscalculation that happened on both their parts there. They didn't, in Bridgeport, they didn't expect to get the president coming in 48 hours before an election and double the highest turnout they ever had. Uh, you know, it's not excusable, but you can see why it happened. We need to have, you know, uh, Denise Merrill put in that law afterwards about certifying the number of ballots we ordered based on past history. That's something that's been working very well. Uh, there are remedies for these things. As far as consistency across the board, the Registrars of Voters Association is very much in favor of certification for all our registrars. Um, and that's something we, we actually do work uh, on a committee with four registrars, a member from the secretary's office, and a member from elections enforcement. And I believe they're about ready to present their program, uh, working with the different branches of UConn. And this is something our members are very, very, very interested in doing. Certification means more education, more training, more consistency. And let's face it, when you have a certified position in your town, you can go back to your town and ask for more money. So there is an incentive also to take that certification class. What does the certification class involve? What sort of skills are being taught and what emphasis are you putting on it? Um, you're going to learn everything about your job. You're going to learn Title IX statutes. You're going to learn, which is what we're all governed under. You're going to learn all about um, how to administer your office day to day, how to prepare for election, how to order your supplies. Basically, all the things that go throughout, how to run your canvas, which we do annually when we're in the middle of doing right now. Um, every single thing that's an aspect of the, the job is going to be encompassed in that certification program, which will take several years to complete. It's not like it's you know a seminar over a weekend. This is very intensive, very thoughtful, very well presented, and you know, like I said, they're about ready to do the you know present it to the secretary's office for her blessing. But um, it's it's something that we've all been looking forward to and wanting for a long time. Let me ask you this: What sort of person fits the job best? Who does this suit? you got to have somebody who cares about it and believes in it, number one. This is not just a, a nine-to-fiver job where you punch in, punch out, and it doesn't really matter. Um, you have to really believe in what you're doing because you're, it's a customer service job. 
you are serving the customer, that's your voter. And you need to be there for them, you need to help them with the registration process, help them when they're changing registrations. One of my favorites is helping them when they bring their kids in to register, that's always a good one. Um, so you're, it's customer service all the way, from the minute they register to the time they leave the voting booth on election day. It has to be a good process with for the them sticker? all the way. If they want the sticker. Always take a sticker. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, you've heard the way we do it here in the land of steady habits. Is there anything you've heard today that you think would be at odds with the state of Rhode Island system? Well, one thing uh, you know right away that I, I hear is that it sounds like the local municipalities are in charge of ballot orders and, and doing that. And in Rhode Island, the, the Secretary of State is in charge of uh, the ballot orders for the cities and towns. So over the years, we've had issues where maybe not enough ballots have been ordered for certain areas, and we've, we've upped it and things like that. So we have the ability as a state to decide how many ballots should be ordered for a municipality, uh, which I think you know, works great because we can, it works great for the municipalities because we pay for the ballots as well. So the, burden, <laughs> uh, the financial burden is taken off of the, yeah. the cities and towns. Uh, but that's one difference that I see. I, I know that a lot of the appointed officials in Rhode Island and we're going through it right now with a couple of different towns where they're going through the process of hiring someone to be the next uh, board of canvassers in a particular town. And there was one community that had over 60 resumes for the position, wow. uh, which is, I think, a sign That's of the times. It's tough, you know, economically, but yeah. it's also great that there's going to be, um, you know, some, something that people can look at to decide who they want to hire. And I think that's a great way to do it because it, it gives people the chance to see why you want to hire somebody. Uh, but like I said, we do have uh, 10 communities that elect their town clerks. And to a T, all 10 that are elected are absolutely tremendous. They've been there for a while and do a great job. So I think it's we have a unique blend of elected and appointed in Rhode Island. By and large, it's, it is appointed, but it works great. And I know that you know the checks and balances that Melissa was talking about in Rhode Island, we use the... Uh, who, the appointing authority as a checks and balances. I mean, if, if the council or the mayor uh, sees that there's something going on in the elections office that isn't right, if there's any political influence, what have you, uh, they have, that's the check and balances where they'd be asked to, you know, they'd be removed from the position. And I can tell you that I've worked on and off in the Secretary of State's office for the last eight years, and it doesn't, it doesn't happen where there's a, a political problem. I mean, could it happen? Of course it could. But we do have checks and balances in Rhode Island where, if it were to happen, uh, the, the governing authority would be able to handle the situation. And I also think, as far as the training go, because we have the ability to train the, uh, the local boards of canvassers, we actually held a training last Friday for all the new members of the, of the state, uh, the local municipalities' boards of canvassers. It was great to meet the new boards of canvassers and train them on the system. The Board of Elections has training on, on certain parts of the elections, and we do it quite frequently, multiple times a year. So we keep a close interaction with, uh, with the cities and towns and offer tra training quite frequently. And because we're small, uh, we usually like to go out if it is a new registrar that gets uh, appointed. We'll go out and do a one-to-one -one right at the town hall because we think it's a good relationship builder, but it also uh, it helps with, with the training process. Fortunately, we've had a, uh, we had a bunch of the new clerks up last week, which was great to meet them all and, and do the training. So I think that's the difference I see a little bit from Rhode Island and Connecticut. But the big one is, is the ballots. I think uh, having the state pay for them and order them, it takes the burden off the, the municipalities. We talk uh, about and we hear a lot about the media. Is the media helping or hurting the elections process in Connecticut? And then we'll talk about Rhode Island. Denise? Um, I'd have to think about that. I, I mean, in general, I think it helps. You, you want as much transparency as possible. Um, naturally, the media tends to gravitate toward the more dramatic situations where something goes wrong. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. There were very similar, I mean, just this last election, for example, in Hartford, that's the one that came to everybody's attention because the media uh, was right there mm -hmm. <laughs> to watch the governor not be able to vote. Uh, so, but the very same uh, situation occurred in numerous other towns. It just didn't come to the attention of the media. So it's hard to say. I mean, I don't like this focus on just everything that's wrong with government. I think it's been quite destructive, actually, in the long term. Uh, but I'm not sure it's all the media's fault either. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people responsible. I, I find it very interesting to listen to Rob talk about Rhode Island uh, because 
um, I, as you can see, even Rhode Island and, and New England in general is much more decentralized than the rest of the country. But uh, Connecticut's even more decentralized than Rhode Island, mm -hmm. which is, in, we did look at the model in Rhode Island of these boards of canvassers, but they have to have them in each town, which would take care of that partisan situation, um, it, I think, more effectively than having two partisan registrars. Because we also have town clerks, which mm -hmm. we haven't talked about yet, but um, the town clerk, I think, is more analogous to the election officials in um, Rhode Island, who are both appointed and elected in different towns. And again, you know, so they've just handled this whole question of who who has the um, the sort of the, is looking to make sure that everything is fair and above board, which I think is terribly important. Honestly, as you said before, you know you need to make sure that the public thinks that the the election has integrity. Yeah, so absolutely, Melissa, would you talk just a minute about that yourself? Um, start with the media, and do you think it's helping the image of our registrars, or do you think that it's hurting? Well, the media is great about getting the word out about when a vote is happening, where you're voting, highlighting some of the great stories that happen, you know, during that. That's all really great. Um, I do agree sometimes they kind of are a little happier when something's not really going right and they can kind of blow it up. If it's really wrong, that's absolutely vital that they're reporting that. Mm -hmm. If it's just a misunderstanding, and sometimes it's on the media's part of a misunderstanding of how an election law is, um, they can they can be a little overzealous, but we'd be lost without them. So you know, it, it, it's just it's a necessary thing to have in our polling places. So. And Rob, how does the media treat you folks in Rhode Island? Well, I think, by and large, the media, I think, is, is great, especially today with Facebook and Twitter, where people, that's how people get a lot of their information now. And when we put out a, a, a tweet or a Facebook post saying that there's an election in a, a certain part of the state, we get, we always try to track how people hear about things, and we get feedback, positive feedback, about our social media. Uh, I think that the other media, the TV, the radio and stuff, I think that is another checks and balances on the system. Uh, cer certainly they, uh, there are instances where there might be some misinformation and wrong information gets out there and that happens, but I think when they call attention to something, even if, they, if it's overblown a little bit, I think it keeps all the election administrators kind of on their toes, like, okay, let's go and check this out and see you know, what's going on here and try to fix it. So by and large, I think it's great. I think it really helps out, get the word out. Like Melissa said, it also operates as a checks and balances. But at times, it could be, uh, it could be difficult if, if things aren't uh, relayed the right way. But by and large, I think it's a positive for elections. Let's talk just a minute about those oopses that have happened in the past um, in Connecticut and nationwide. Um, and now's a good time to talk about how some of the other 49 states handle the electoral process. In the 2012 presidential election, Many states had problems with long lines, ran out of ballots, had incorrect ballots on hand, opened late, and worse. Not to sound flip, but as registrar voters, you have one job. It's one day, and it's not even a surprise. How can we not be prepared for Election Day? This led to President Obama assembling the Bipartisan Presidential Commission on Election Administration. And let's talk a minute about what's been said about the findings of that temporary task force, because we've already touched on them just in the course of our conversation. So we'll start with um, the number one point. The task force uh, advocates for professionalism. Melissa, what do you think about that? Certification. Certification. That is something that we are also advocating for. And in fact, it's part of Rovex's mission statement that ongoing training lead to certification. It is something we have been fighting for and working towards for over 15 years since the last certification program was disbanded. <laughs> Are there standards for this certification, and is it only applicable in Connecticut, or is that nationwide? This is in Connecticut, and again, as my previous answer to you, it's a committee that works for registrars, a member of the Secretary's Office, and a member of Elections Enforcement, and they are working with the Yukon branches to bring it to various areas of the state, and it would be one program that would be universal for all registrars and their deputies and assistants and anybody else who wants to take it to learn about elections. Um, it would be available for those people to take that progr those programs and learn about how it should work. Okay. And Rob, in Rhode Island, how are, is the professionalism of the job gauged? I think by the trainings that we have, we don't have a, a certification process per se, but we do require, uh, and that's kind of a, uh, a soft requirement, I mean there's nothing in law, but we require all the cities and towns, especially when they're new, to come for training. We host training for every 
situation that happens during the election cycle, we host trainings for it. The next thing we're going to be training is the National Change of Address program that we do. So we'll host a training in a couple weeks that goes through the National Change of Address. And then a year from now, when we're getting into the presidential election cycle, we hold trainings on the nomination papers and about declarations and things like that. So we are constantly having training. There's no, again, certification process, but it's certainly vital that... Uh, especially when we're talking about the oopses. I mean, when there's an oops in any part of the state, it reflects on the state, uh, not just on the local municipality. So it's everybody's best invested in the fact that we've got to come together, we've got to train, and we've got to make sure that everybody's on the same page, including ourselves as, as state leaders. Uh, we go to trainings uh, quite frequently. There are different national um, state election directors association has trainings every year that are important to attend. So across the across the board, it's important for everyone to be professionally trained and so that there's minimal issues when it comes time to uh, to run an election. I just want to say one thing. You had mentioned that a lot of people think that elections is just one day and that people have in their minds that, uh, you know, if, if something goes wrong on election day, how can that be? You take two years to, to prepare for an election. And I think we all know that elections isn't just, you know, one day. I mean, the election day is just one day, but the preparation is months and months, especially in a presidential year. So it's uh, you know, that's another thing we try to get out to people is that it's more than just a, a once every two years thing. It's a, it happens quite frequently, little elections, but there's also a lot that goes into an election. Okay. And Denise, talk a little bit about uh, what you might think about the certification process from the Secretary of State's office. Well, you're right. It is a national issue uh, brought up by this commission uh, specifically now. Uh, and it's a national issue for a reason because the difficulty comes in requiring training of these very, as we've discussed, decentralized processes. There's very little authority from the state or the federal level over local elections. And so we have ongoing trainings, we have for years, and we do them in conjunction with ROVAC, and we do them very successfully. They're held twice a year. We do, we've, we've really ramped up our training efforts. We've had a lot of changes in the election laws recently, and I'll mention the most recent is election day registration, which just came in two years ago, and really this was the first big year that you were able to go and register and vote on the same day. Um, we were very concerned about exactly how that was going to roll out, so we, we actually hired some people to come into our office to go out and visit with many of the larger cities and towns. We hosted three conference calls uh, available to all registrars of voters. So here's where you get into the problem with our current system. We can't really require these things of people. Now, a lot of them do go to the trainings, do come to the conferences, and a lot don't. And that's where we have a problem with the law, because what I would like to do is require those trainings and that certification. The certification problem, it, project is something we have been working on for a number of years. But again, it has to have some teeth. And that's where we get into being able to have standards that we can require across towns. And that's why I made the particular proposal I did, because I think you can, you, appointed people, it's much more, uh, it's much easier to require certain standards from those people. Um, so we offered these conference calls, 47 towns had no one tune in to three conference calls about something that was coming right up. So that's an example of why I think we need to have just sort of more teeth in the whole process. You mentioned something, and, and it kind of goes to accountability at that point. Yes. When somebody is in an appointed position, and there's two bosses, if you will, overlooking the same workload, who's in charge? What happens when somebody has an oops? And what can be done to possibly remove them from a situation from preventing further harm? That's precisely what we would like to see. We would like to see some sort of oversight when that happens. We have instituted some processes just with volunteer attorneys. I've established a program with the Connecticut Bar Association where if, we're, if things are reported to us on election day, we can now go in and try to rectify the situation. And we've been called in in a number of instances. It's worked very well, and we have been able to straighten things out. Uh, but I think it needs to be a step beyond that. There is no removal process. now. I personally don't like the idea of going to, you know, uh, these are very extreme situations, I would think, where you're going to actually remove someone from a job. 
um, especially if they're an elected official. We don't have recall in the state. And so there is a removal process for town clerks, for example, but not for registrars. So there is a proposal that we've put in for the last few years, which I hope will be part of the solution here, which would require that if someone was, let's say, under investigation, which we have some situations like that going on right now, that there would that the Election Enforcement Commission, for example, or the court could step in and say that person needs to step aside, for example, while that was ongoing. Those kinds of accountability measures, I think, is what we really should be looking at, at the very least. I do think, though, that if the person were in an appointed position, you can hire and fire. And so if you don't do your job properly, you can be let go. And that's, that's the difference, actually, between what, I, what I'd like to see. I'd like to see more a situation like you're hearing about in Rhode Island. Okay. Melissa, talk about that for just a minute. Sure. Um, nobody wants to see somebody lose their job over an honest mistake. What happens when something happens? Well, as, as the Secretary said, um, there is no recall. Uh, provision at the moment for registrars of voters. There is one for the town clerks. Not really sure why it never was incorporated with registrars when that was put in. I don't know the history of that. Um, but I just want to point out, if someone is appointed, say, um, by a mayor of a large city, and it's, hey, it's my cousin's daughter really needs a job, and I'm, they, she's got the qualifications, I'm going to appoint her. And say that person doesn't do what that mayor wants. Maybe the mayor is asking them to do something inappropriate. This has happened in communities throughout Connecticut where selectmen or mayors ask their registrars to do something inappropriate. And the registrars currently have a little daylight to stand on because they're elected officials and they say, no, you can't make me do this. I'm concerned that if somebody's appointed, they, you, hey, you don't do this, you're fired. It happens. It happens in city government all the time where, where employees of, of the government have to comply with what the head of that government wants. And I think it's too important to say, well, it won't happen most of the time. If it happens in two or three instances where someone does something inappropriately because they're beholden to the one who hired them, I think that's a problem. Absolutely. Some other issues that, were, that came from that bipartisan commission were, and this is a pretty powerful statement, election administration is public administration. Rob, what does that mean to you in Rhode Island? Well, I think when we're talking about elections, that's one area that affects just about everybody. If you're 18 and over, you're able to vote, and those that aren't 18 uh, will be able to vote sometime. And so you're working with uh, you're working with the public. Like Melissa had said, it's all about customer service. And I think when you're working with the public, uh, whatever it is, whether it's elections, whether it's business services, or what have you, there needs to be that overarching public administration. Uh, umbrella. I think it falls under the public administration umbrella without without question. I think that when people look at their government, when they look at uh, the when the public looks at the government, no matter what type of government it is or what section of government it is, everyone's kind of looked at as government, and we have an obligation to the people to provide the services that we are supposed to provide. And in our case, it's a, f a fast, smooth, fair election. And so I, I do think that the two are are intertwined without question. Let me ask you this. Um, professionalism, we talked about a lot about that, a lot about the job training and the things that go behind it. But what about knowledge of emerging technologies? What does the voting booth of the future look like and what skills will be required to run that booth? Denise. That's a great question, and we've been talking about this at the national level quite a bit. In fact, there was a, actually a demonstration of the voting booth of the future at our last uh, national secretaries meeting, and it, it basically looks a lot like what you see at airlines right now. You come and you flash your iPhone with its scanner on it, and it scans in your information. You go in, you don't have a paper ballot, you, everything is done electronically. Yeah, I know. That's the part that I don't think that would fly in Connecticut. I'm Personally, I'm very happy with our scan machines because we do have a paper trail. So, But there's going to be a lot of changes in the next few years, largely, I think, around identification at the polls. I think this whole argument about you know, photo IDs is probably going to go away based on new technologies. It, we're, it's just going to be a lot easier to identify who people are. But uh, those all require a lot more skill and uh, ability with computers than we have in the past. And there, there are a lot of people still working in elections who don't use computers at all. And so that's a problem, too. I mean, and that should be one of the requirements for the job. 
I, I agree. Yeah, I do. Melissa, how does the Roback membership feel about something like that? We are pro-technology. Um, we yeah. last year we spearheaded the effort to get poll books, uh, electronic check-in books, into our, our into our statutes, which we were successfully able to do. Um, we have long been advocating for uh, high-speed scanning of post-election audits instead of hand counting. There's a lot of good technology out there. Uh, many of our members, you know, they come up with great technological ways of doing things and they share it with the group at our conferences. Uh, you know, better ways of doing your end-of-night spreadsheets, better ways of doing this. And we've often worked with the Secretary's Office on certain technology things. I believe on the latest end-of-night reporting system there was some input from Registrar. So it's something, we're on the front lines. We understand how difficult it is to be downloading a non-fillable form from the computer, writing it in by hand and faxing it back. This is nonsensical. You know, we all want to we all want to get to bed before four in the morning on election night too. It's okay. You know, so to say that we're not comfortable with computers, and I know that's not exactly what you meant, but it's just not true. We can't even register a voter without using a computer. When that computer system needs a big upgrade too. We want more technology. We want easier technology to use for us. It'll make our jobs easier, and it also removes human error. Human error is going to happen no matter what, what sector of life you're in, no matter what you're doing. But if you have technology that can help reduce that, that's great. And that's something we're all looking forward to. And I'll ask this, just throw it out to anybody. Do you see a day where, and forgetting about absentee ballots for a minute, do you see a day where I can vote on my phone? Not Rob? until Target doesn't get hacked. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm right with you. <laughs> I, 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 was, right there. I was at the same conference that the secretary was at a, a month ago, and there was uh, there was technology that I was able to demonstrate that you can you can vote on your phone, meaning you can mark your ballot on your phone, uh, and then you walk up to the machine and you have it scanned, and it prints out how you voted. Right. So I, I know that's probably not what you meant, but I mean you are actually voting on your phone to save time. You can do it while you're standing in line. You scan it, it prints out how you voted. You slide it in the machine. I think that. I agree with the paper ballot system. I think having paper ballots is essential for recounts, for uh, any sort of, you know, just a receipt that something happened. I know that there was a, a, a county, I believe, in North Carolina that lost a bunch of votes when they did it electronically, when it was yeah. tabulated electronically with no paper ballots. And that's just, I think that is probably an extreme. It's an extreme that I'm not willing to take a chance on. But I think, you know, people always ask, oh, are we going to be able to vote online in the future? And I think. I think if you were to ask someone 10 years ago, could we shop online, people would say there's no way, and here we are doing it. So I think that the potential is out there. I think that there's a, there are a whole lot of hurdles that need to be jumped before we get there. Uh, the signature is one. You know, voter fraud is another thing, which I think, again, over time with technology, it could be rectified. But that, those are the concerns that I have about voting on your phone or voting on the internet. That's interesting. I, I am all about the tech. The more I can do online, the, the better it Except is. Except you want lever machines back. I am all about the lever <laughs> machines. They, I don't know. You know what? It's, it's funny. They used to you know, be like kind of hurry it up, hurry it up. And I'm the person who goes in. You know, I read the placards on the way in. I read the ballot. You know, I read the front and the back, and I check it to make sure that I've got it all. It takes me a long time to vote because it's a really serious responsibility. I don't understand how people can just breeze in. I don't know, maybe they're more prepared than I am. Uh, breeze in, check, 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 off they go with a sticker. You know, I, I don't know. And, to, and in our small town, and I'll get to this in a second, it's pretty social. You go down to the town hall to vote, you bump into people that you haven't seen in a long time. Hey, how are you? How's the kids? How's your cow? I live in Franklin, I said. <laughs> so it's, it's an important part of our culture is that whole voting process. So as much as I say I want to be able to do it on my phone, I, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably go down there and do the traditional thing. So I just touched on that a little bit. What about the differences in small towns like Franklin where we may have only 1,000 voters versus big cities like Bridgeport? Um, talk a minute about the costs for hired professionals, access to a professional, and possibly shared services. Denise. That is part of the challenge. Um, not that the job needs to be full-time. I think technology is going to also impact what kind of work needs to be done and how much, even in small towns. Uh, so that, that's exactly the challenge, is how do you get qualified people in every one of 169 towns, some of them very small, mm -hmm. like Franklin. And I think the answer is we've got to have the resources to make that happen. But if it's part of a bigger 
picture uh, in many towns, like probably Franklin, the town clerk's office is where you do the land records. You, you do a number of functions in that office. Mm -hmm. This could be another one of them because it's a very similar administrative job in many ways. So I think that towns would be more able to spread that cost until we get to a point where, honestly, I think at some point the state should take over the cost for elections. That's the sticking point, really, because right now the towns are paying almost all the costs. So you have to look at the whole thing as a piece, um, but it is a problem. Because of all the budget cuts, does that sort of encourage or allow the towns to cut corners? Well, I, I mean, it is, it's an issue at every level of government, you know, and they're trying to be responsible with their budgets, and they're looking to cut back where they can. And, you know, and, and in some places, you know, registrars are very well supported, and elections are very well supported. Uh, but the, the range is just tremendous. I can't, I can't tell you. I mean, you've got everything from Hartford that has three registrars, all making over $80,000 a year, three deputy registrars, also required by statute, all making over $60,000 a year, plus numerous people in the town clerk's office that do the absentee ballots. So it ranges from that to the town of Union, where they couldn't find a registrar of either one or the other party for several years, which is another problem, uh, as mm -hmm. you can tell. Yeah. Um, and they pay them, I think, $785 a year to do the job. So that's the range we're dealing with, and that's part of the problem. I think eventually some of these may consolidate in some way, um, but that's what we're looking for. We've got to get some efficiencies out of the system in whatever way works for all the towns. Melissa, your ROVAC members come from all 169 towns, mm -hmm. I imagine. We have 162 of our towns are represented. Okay, fantastic. So that's a very broad representation yes. of our state. Small towns like Franklin, a large city like Bridgeport, what are the differences that you see within your membership and what changes do you think might be coming down the road? I think what, the most thing we see is, is just the workload. Um, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm from Bethlehem, not much bigger than Franklin. Uh, we have goats, not cows. Okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the workload is, is much smaller. Obviously, we have one polling place. We're not like our neighbor, Waterbury, who has 21 polling places. Uh, but the, the essential job is the same. It again, it goes back to that customer service. You, whether the voter is from Bethlehem or Franklin or Bridgeport or Hartford, they should have that consistent and good experience in their voting life. What's happening in the background as far as how many staff we have and what we pay them and if they're union and do they get benefits and do they get pensions, that really isn't about what the voter it should be you know, concerned with. The voters should be concerned with that they're getting the service that they need from the time they register to the time they vote. So uh, there, while there are differences, they tend to be just differences of size and some of the more things about finding poll workers. Um, some of the cities are hiring over 200 people on the day. That's not going to change no matter what we do to the system because we need poll workers at our polling places. So finding somebody to work for one day a year, that is a little bit challenging and it's challenging to have you know, the resources to do that. I would love to see us have a statewide database of poll workers, people who are willing to drive and go anywhere they want you know, at, at a last minute, much like we do with moderators. I think that would be something we could easily do and, and that, that would increase the level of training for everybody. That's interesting. When I was a little girl, my grandmother was a poll worker. So she would go to her precinct or district, um, vote in the morning first thing, and then she would sit on a table, you know, greeting her community yep. mm -hmm. from like 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. And mm -hmm. they have these little old deers doing it for a 14-hour day. It's just a long day, I imagine. They have a lot more stamina than some of these kids, I'll tell yeah, you. I bet they do. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot more passion for it. <laughs> it. And that passion is so important, yes. and that's why we're all here today. Rob, let me ask you this. You've heard a lot about how we do things here in Connecticut, and I was being flipped before, and I'm sorry, but tell us, in, in Rhode Island, do you think that your system would work better for us? Do you think that it's something we could do differently? What, what do you hope we take away from your conversation today? I just think it's, and I want to make it clear too that I'm taking a lot from this as well, uh, from uh, your I see you taking standpoint. notes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think that it, it's got to be what works for the, for the communities. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, in Rhode Island, like I said, we've got 10 communities that elect their town clerks. And having worked in a local community for the last year and a half, I say without hesitation that the, it's the busiest office in local government. And in all 10 cases in Rhode Island, they handle elections. 
So I think that it in it in the ten town clerks run elections great in those communities, and then the other twenty nine communities things work great with appointed officials. So I think that it's something that it depends on on the state. It depends on the the relationship between the the municipalities and the state, uh, and even the federal government in certain ways, where you can have. Open, open the door to conversation and to see how you can make it better. I think it's great that these panels are put together where the Secretary of State's office and the local municipalities have a way to interact with, with each other. And that's what I think we do great in Rhode Island is that we have a, an open door policy where we always, as a matter of fact, we're working on legislation right now where we meet with the local town clerks regularly to try to figure out what we can do uh, as, a, as a group. Because in the end, at the end of the day, it's all for the voters. It's all f what can we do to make things more convenient without ever crossing that you know, voter fraud line because you have to be careful about some, if you're too convenient, uh, it could lead to problems on election day. But it's just, it's a way to have a conversation. And I think that's the best thing that I would, that I take out of this is just a conversation to go back to my boss and say, this is how they do things in Connecticut. And maybe in Connecticut, when we leave here, you can say, this is how they do things in Rhode Island and maybe this could work in Connecticut. I think that's the biggest thing. That's what I get most out of when I go to the national conferences and regional conferences. How are other states doing it that we can maybe do it better? What I've heard from all three of our panelists this evening is that they all have a very strong passion for the voting process, for our democracy and our history. So let's just wrap up uh, over the next course of the next couple of minutes. Denise Merrill, Merrill is Connecticut Secretary of State. Would you summarize what you think about this SB 1051 and what might happen going forwards? Yes, I think you can hear that we have a lot of co ground in common. Mm -hmm. And as you say, I think we all care about elections. You wouldn't do these jobs otherwise. And the bottom line is, it is about the voters. It's about them having the same experience, no matter if they live in Bethlehem or Hartford. And that's where we're trying to get. And I, I think we're going to get there, because I think we do agree on more than we disagree about. I would love to get down to one person accountable in every town. Uh, big picture, I think in the years to come, we may see some more consolidation. But uh, beyond that, I, I, I totally appreciate the dedication of people at every level. That, and I'm always amazed that elections run as well as they do, because we do pretty well. But uh, we can't have any more of these you know, days where I spend my, my election day in court. And that's what I'm very concerned about. And I think we need to make some changes. And I think there'll be good changes. I would think so, too. Melissa Russell is the president of the Registrar of Voters Association of Connecticut. Melissa, would you summarize your thoughts on the topic? Well, I think one of the good things that came out of Hartford, if anything good can be said about it, is that we're all actually having these conversations. And we're having them sort of in a high profile way so that um, some of the things that we maybe each of us have been concerned about over the years is now getting a little daylight on it and people are taking it a little bit more seriously. Normally, uh, people don't pay attention to how elections run unless something's a, there's a problem on election day. And even though you know we've been maybe wishing for different technological advances or different different processes, nobody's really been listening in Hartford until this, these issues have occurred. So this is a good opportunity to really talk about and study where we need to go from here. So, and again, we have so many things that we do agree on. We ought to be able to move forward with some of it at least. I would hope so. And Rob Rock is the Rhode Island Director of Elections. Rob, I've seen you taking notes furiously over there. Share a little bit I about- I can't read them, that's the problem. <laughs> I, I think uh, the, the biggest piece of elections is that it's such a sensitive topic. I think you know, Connecticut has is 169 communities, and if there was a, a community or two that had an issue during the election season, that's less than 1% of the communities had an issue. In any other realm, 99% out of 100 is pretty good. But in elections, unfortunately, that 1% is, is focused on. So I think in the end, you're trying to, as a team, figure out the best ways to, to accommodate and to have fast, fair, and accurate elections because, again, it affects so many people. It affects, when we go talk to kids at high schools, you know, I always say that government and, and politics matters more to them than it does to anybody else. They have their whole lives ahead of them. And so it affects every walk of life. Every single person is affected by elections. And that's why I think it's so important to come to the table, have these discussions. I could, I'm going to try to decipher these notes when I get back to the <laughs> office and try to see what we can do in Rhode Island from what I've heard today to try to make things better. And I just think it's the conversation is really what, uh, what drives moving forward. We only have about two minutes left, but let's just touch on the youth for a minute. Um, 
What do you say, and I'm gonna ask all three of you this, and I'm sure you've heard it before, what do you say when somebody says, I don't vote because it doesn't matter? Melissa. Um, it's a problem from our educational system. We don't do civics, it, or we don't stress civics enough uh, so that people see how it really does matter. Um, in our town of Bethlehem, the vote that we get the least participation on is our school board vote, and that's the ones who spend the most money, hire the most people, and are probably 90% of our town's budget is our regional school budget, and we have the fewest people participating. It's l making them understand that one vote, or two votes, or four votes, really does make a difference. And we do try to get that word out to the schools. We go there annually. We're at the Bethlehem Fair. You know, we talk to, the, talk to people as much as we can. But I think it's a national disease, unfortunately. Apathy is just a national disease. I, I would agree. <laughs> Rob, yeah. why vote? I, what does I, it matter? You know, I, I love when people say that they think it doesn't matter, because I usually have a laundry list of things of why it does matter. <laughs> and especially with, with the youth that votes in in bad numbers, very low numbers, the lowest uh, group of people, that, the lowest percentage for the people that vote. And I always talk about things like uh, curfews. There was a, a Rhode Island uh, city that instituted a curfew mm -hmm. for kids under 18 years old. They had to be in by, I think, 10 o'clock. Uh, proms, every year there are schools that get, get rid of proms if, if classes aren't behaving well. These are things that elected leaders are making these decisions for, for America's youth. And I think it's so important to get them out there and get them voting. And I also agree with Melissa that you know, we've, as kids, we learn about Abraham Lincoln, we learn about George Washington, and it's extremely important to know about them. But most kids can't tell you who their state senator is, who their council person is, and not just youth, but even older people can't tell you who their local elected leaders are. And I think that's something that needs to change. We need to be able to teach kids and adults why it's important to vote. Who are these people that are making your decisions? It's extremely important. We've got to do a better job of it. The education system's got to do a better job of it. And society in general, we've really got to step it up. I agree 100%. Denise, take us out. Okay. Why should I go vote? <laughs> civics, civics, civics. Yes, and absolutely it should be taught more in the schools. But it's not just about that. I actually find the young people sort of more inspired than older people. They don't vote because they don't have the habit of voting. And I think that was that's something that needs to be rectified. And that can be rectified by education. But I feel like we're always lecturing people about how it should matter. And they just, they're not feeling it. And I don't know if it's just a general dissatisfaction with everything these days that they get most of their information from television, which is usually national. So mm -hmm. I guess what we have to do is take that national interest that happens every four years and make sure people use it those other years when things that are closer to home really matter more in a lot of ways. It does go back to education, I think. So hopefully we'll get there. There's a lot of attention being paid right now to this lack of civics in the schools and some legislation that I think will be forthcoming soon. So. I think so too, and I'd like to see positive change in the state of Connecticut. Rhode Island, keep up the good work. <laughs> so to close out, this has been a production of the League of Women Voters of Southeastern Connecticut. Thank you so much for joining us, all of our panelists. I appreciate your time and your travel and your honest input this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.